I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 28th of December, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, I'm going to be answering a viewer question. This touches on something we've talked about a bit spread out in pieces over the last year or so, including episodes on gentrification, changing of costs over time, will Nicaragua turn into the next Costa Rica, and so forth. And his question, which I'll read when we get into the main body of the show, is basically with all of the people that I'm telling and others are telling about Nicaragua and how fantastic it is, won't that information get out there and lead to Nicaragua no longer being the paradise that it is? That's a great question and a real concern. So let's dive into that right after the bump. answering this question from Christopher House at 7937. I'm curious if there's an increase in gringos and new residents or tourists expats in Nicaragua, will this be a threat to the low cost of living and rent in the country due to social media and YouTubers getting the word out of how inexpensive Nicaragua is as a place to live? This is a good question and this plays into a lot of questions uh, or topics that we've covered over the last year. The a change over time of Nicaragua is something that people are concerned about because we have seen in many places around the world that when the word gets out, when it becomes a known location that goes from obscurity to popularity, that uh, prices change, not just for the expats or tourists or whoever's moving into the country, but also for those who live there. For example, in Costa Rica, many Costa Ricans or uh, Ticos are unable to afford living in their own country. Of course, they can find somewhere to live, but they can't afford to live in the places and communities that they used to traditionally because it has been taken over by expats and tourists and the prices have been raised to where the local economy no longer supports those areas. So those are real concerns we have to think about both when we're looking at a place long term, what are we looking at as far as expected change over time, but also with the actions and behaviors that we have as for example a YouTuber or a social media influencer how do we potentially impact those countries? Do we lead them down that path? Do we steer people away or are we inconsequential in the long run? So this is a great question let's dig into it. All right, so this is a great question and we've got a couple different aspects of things we wanna look at here. The first is from the social influence side of things. Does shows on YouTube and posts on Instagram showing the beauty of or explaining the cost of or uh, giving detailed information on how to logistically make a move or a vacation in Nicaragua happen, are these things potentially negative to the country? Well, that's a great question. We should ask that. So let's first look at uh, an underpinning of that, and that is tourism economies across the board. So if we were looking at a giant economy, such as a, a giant tourism economy, such as a France and Italy, a Spain, or the United States, in these countries, there's no amount of social media posting that's going to skew uh, tourism in any particular way on a grandiose scale. You may shift a tiny percentage here and there, maybe a fraction of point. 0.1%. If you really had a, an inertia behind the number of influencers, you might be able to promote Provence over Paris or something like that and shift a tiny bit of Parisian traffic to south of France, but you're not going to create big changes because there's lots of tourism to, to be moving because of its existing inertia. So in these places, they've hit kind of a critical mass of tourism and, and influence is no longer a major factor. You're now looking at shifting slight amounts of demographics rather than anything else. When we're looking at places that are over tourist, such as Costa Rica, they make a great example, then social media does help a little bit to keep that momentum going. But in reality, it stays going without social media uh, at all. So it doesn't doesn't really play in as much as you might think. For the rest of the world, to the world that is undiscovered, as people often put it, there is a fear that social media is going to cause a sudden upswing in the amount of tourism that goes there and create problems. Now, the first question is, do you see this happening much of anywhere in the world? And the reality is, no, you actually don't. I'm not saying it's never happened, but it does not happen commonly. When you go to places that do not have a lot of tourists, they remain not having a lot of tourists. In a place like Nicaragua, all of the social media that is here is still a couple things you have to consider. One, not able to make so many people come here that it even comes up to a baseline of tourism. And two, 
not a large amount of social media whatsoever. There is a certain amount of social media giving information about a place that is always going to exist, just as it always did with traditional media. Before there was any social media, we had things like the Travel Channel or uh, Condé, Nast, Condé Nast Traveler and other media outlets like that that are non-social, the traditional print media or traditional uh, broadcast media. And with those, they would talk about the value of, for example, Nicaragua, uh, and a certain percentage of people would come here and a certain percentage would not. Some people just want to learn about options or find out more information, dig into it, or just want to see what a place is like because they want to dream, but they probably don't actually want to go. They know that they might go, but it's, it's not a very certain thing. And in all honesty, this is what drove me to Nicaragua. Initially was watching traditional media. It was actually the travel channel. We learned a little bit about Nicaragua and while we didn't come here simply because of that, it planted a seed that later when the opportunity arose, that memory of, well, that was a place we thought was interesting, was able to take hold and we moved down. So those things do exist. So you have to consider that there is a baseline of tourism that every country should have or wants to have. Uh, and you have to wonder about any particular country. Are they at that level? Are they above or below? And some places want a lot like Costa Rica. They want a much larger number of tourists than many of the places around them, uh, but they are still above the number that they want at this point. And that is still a disputed thing. If you go to the, Nic the Costa Rican government, you may find that they're still interested in drawing in more and more tourists. And in fact, if you uh, look at some of the uh, political uh, policies that they've been enacting within recent times, such as increasing the availability of their digital nomad visas, they are making a push to draw in more people. They are not actively trying to stem the tourism tide. So they, while a lot of us say it's overrun with tourists, it's, it's overpriced, there's all these negatives, Costa Rica as a country is not actually agreeing with us necessarily, at least not in whole. So that's important to keep in mind that this is not a clear cut, nobody wants more tourists. There are very, very few countries that don't want to have more tourism because it it represents more economy for them. So it's generally seen as the more the better. I agree. There are times that that is not true. There are many times that that is not true. And Costa Rica is an example of a place I tend to not want to spend a lot of time because of all the tourists. However, like Orlando, sometimes it is nice to have a place that has all the tourists together. There's a certain percentage of the human population that wants to be tourists and travel, and a certain percentage that wants to become expats and live in a place other than the place where they grew up. And that's not necessarily about uh, politics or cost of living or anything like that. There's a certain number of people like me who find where I grew up to simply be pedestrian, and I want to be somewhere else. That's a real factor. I've always wanted to live abroad. Long before I was aware of politics, the idea of living abroad was very uh, attractive to me. And that's how society plays out. There are people who move for other reasons and certainly people are more dynamic than I like to live abroad or I don't. But the idea that there's a certain percentage of the population that wants to live abroad and a certain percentage that never wants to travel is basically a fixed ratio that doesn't change. So by having social media or whatever that promotes the idea of travel doesn't shift that line very much, maybe a small amount. Maybe we have 60% want to be sedentary, 40% want to live abroad, and by doing a big social media push and really getting the ideas out there, we shift that to 59 and 41%. Yes, that's plausible, but in general, we're not changing those numbers a lot, and we're not changing where people go that much. The influence just isn't that high. So when we're looking at the economies of countries on a big scale, uh, we really don't have this, we're likely to tell people and have people flood in problem like is often perceived. There is a certain, I want it saved for me. Once people learn about a place, there is a desire to have no one else know about it, have it preserved in a bubble, treat it like a colony and and say, okay, it's, it's preserved and, and it's a secret and it's my secret. And I'm gonna be able to take advantage of the fact that we're not telling anyone about it and they aren't finding out organically in the way that they would with other places. One of the reasons that Costa Rica is able to keep property values up is because it's really easy to learn about property values. One of the reasons that Nicaraguan's property values are low is because it's hard to learn about their property values. However, it's worth pointing out that one of the things that social media is doing is exposing the fact that expats are routinely being overcharged by insane amounts on their real estate. So right now, social media is doing a ton to reduce the cost of housing 
as far as it pertains to expats or to tourists, to foreigners in Nicaragua. So this is a lot more complex of a question than it may seem on the surface. Uh, before there was good social media and there was only businesses posting uh, online pricing and, and were able to control a message about how much things cost, they were, as they always do, putting out higher prices than reality would dictate otherwise with more information. The more social information we have, the more we know how low prices can be. And just because people know that prices can be lower doesn't mean there's gonna be a lot more sales. It does encourage some amount of additional sales, but very, very few. And I can tell you from watching this on the ground, having been here for years, doing this for years, we don't see, even with what we do here, we are not seeing some increase in the number of people here by, by major numbers. It is very small increases, and it is nowhere near the increases that happened before the big push from social media. The natural growth of tourism from the traditional or semi-traditional, when uh, social media was a very new thing and not very influential to travel, saw Nicaragua come up to a very large uh, tourism rate, not to the rate of Costa Rica, but far in excess of what it is today, uh, back six, seven years ago, seven years ago, I suppose. And uh, since then, we've been at a lull at a very small fraction of what that used to be. At that time, we did not have a problem that the prices were getting high. We did not have a problem that the government was wanting to put the brakes on and not have more tourists. And nothing like that was going on. They were very excited. Everyone is very healthy. There still were houses on the market. There was more people trying to take advantage of people getting misinformation. That's always going to be the case. But we did, we did not see at somewhere between 50% and 500% or even 1,000% of the current tourism rate, did we see any of those problems? That doesn't mean that we couldn't see a 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 fold increase in the number of tourists in the country. That's theoretically possible. And if we saw that, would we see a change in prices? I'm going to guess probably. But will we see a dramatic change in prices? Not very likely, because if those people are being drawn by the really low prices, all that's going to happen is as the prices start to come up, the interest will start to go down and it'll naturally regulate itself. So there's protections in the system that keep it from being simply a, we told someone that there's low prices and low prices are simply one day here, one day gone, and one day there's no tourists, next day there's a ton of tourists. It doesn't happen that way at all. That's, that's not a realistic risk. So uh, I think there's a, there's a natural uh, trend towards seeing an exposure uh, of something. Now, keep in mind, the idea that the prices here are low, it's not new. I'm not the first one to tell someone about this, right? There's tons of people forever who's always come to Nicaragua and said, wow, it's beautiful. It's got volcanoes. It's got lakes. There was times where it wasn't safe, times where it is safe, times where it was cheap, times where it wasn't cheap. But in all those times, we didn't see huge changes in the number of tourists coming here the number of tourists that come here remains within a certain band of, of high and low that's, that's roughly cyclical. When we're talking about countries, even really small ones like Nicaragua, where we have roughly 7 million people in the population, you don't have the ability to have social media put out a message and say, look, there's this beautiful thing to do. There's this great, you know, this and that and have it all explode. If you did, you would see places like San Juan del Sur completely be destroyed overnight, right? This is a, a place that is extremely well known. The average person who's coming from North America to Nicaragua is talking about San Juan del Sur. That's what they see in the brochures. That's what they've seen in 90% of the social media. It's what they think is the center of the country. Even people who watch my channel refuse in, in very many cases to really think about Nicaragua as a whole. And they focus on San Juan del Sur as the epicenter of the country, no matter how far afield it is, no matter how much it's fringe to Nicaraguan society, no matter how much those of us that are here don't even think about it from day to day, it's, it's the absolute mindset of nearly everyone because there's so much media pushing people there. And that's fine. It is the tourist hotspot. But even as the tourist hotspot, it's important to remember with all the social media that's been going on for years, this is not new, with all the information that's out there, with the incredible amount of global focus on San Juan del Sur, I mean, it is absolutely famous the world over. With all of that, it is still a small village of 15,000 people. It is still no, does not have a single high-rise hotel. It does not have a single chain hotel. It does not have a single large business of any sort. Yes, the boutique hotels that are there may do quite well in some cases. I actually don't know of any that are, but there's one or two that may be pulling it off. For the most part, you're talking about cheap hostels in rundown buildings near the water, often because of building regulations, because it is a colonial city, so 
it has some problems from that that makes it very difficult to build. But you don't see large amounts of housing. You don't see dense apartment building. You don't see any of the things that you would associate with a massive upswing in tourism because that's not what's happening. There are houses being built in the hills all around the town. There is growth. There is expansion. There, there are things that are signs of a healthy growing economy. Yes, but nothing that even comes close to suggesting the ideas of the high prices, the massive tourism, the densification that would necessarily happen with any place that actually got the social media converting people into active tourists. So you have to really put this in perspective. If, if almost all of the people coming to Nicaragua are focused on San Juan del Sur and they're flooding into that city, you would absolutely expect there to be public transportation taking you there easily, but there is not. You would expect direct runs from the airport taking people there every few minutes, but there is not. You would expect chain hotels like Hilton or Hyatt or Intercontinental or uh, whatever, right? Maybe European chains coming in and, and creating uh, spots where people are able to come in from other countries and, and use their points, use their, their club memberships, anything like that. None of that is happening, not just not in San Juan del Sur, but in the entire zone of Rivas and by and large in all of Nicaragua. There's very few places where you can stay those types of hotels. They're exclusively in Managua and even there, they're few and far between. Hilton has two properties. I believe Intercontinental has two properties. I believe the Hyatt has one. There's not a lot. Right, Best Western has one, maybe two. Um, Crown Plaza is there. I believe that is part of uh, Intercontinental, so I guess they would have three. Uh, but the numbers are very small. Uh, and so you have to look at it from that perspective that where we would have the canary in the mine, the canary is very healthy. There is no sign of there being the first symptoms of tourism-based change actually happening in the country, even in such an isolated spot where it's hard to believe it isn't happening all the time. It's actually amazing as I describe it to think that how could San Juan have the amount of traffic that it does and not have enough to get past the very small hostile market that they have but they just don't have that many people and they don't have enough people spending enough money to bring it up because remember a lot of the traffic that is coming here is coming either because it's cheap or because it's on the backpacker trail and both of those things tend to bring in a fair number of tourists with very little money often in line with what the local population earns meaning that there's very little opportunity to raise the prices those visitors are not ones who are raising property values they're not ones raising hotel rates and things like that so we're we're basically seeing that the early indicators that are very far away um are are saying that we have absolutely nothing to worry about because we would see san juan del sur turn into a completely different place much more like you find on lake atitlan in guatemala we would see that happen a decade or two before we had any concerns of any of it happening in the rest of Nicaragua. And then in the rest of Nicaragua, we would see it maybe 10 or 20 years after San Juan del Sur happen a little bit in Granada. And then we would see it sprinkle on some of the beaches like Ponoloya. And then eventually, after maybe 40 or 50 years, if that was truly happening, then we would start having to worry about it in more pedestrian locations around the country, such as Leon, such as Managua, and so forth. But because we aren't seeing it in San Juan del Sur, not even the earliest indicators at all, the expectation is that really no amount of tourism is ever going to be coming unless something dramatically changes, uh, which is fine. That's not something the country is looking for, and most countries are not. It is uh, unusual right for a place that is like nicaragua meaning that it is a a normal um, it's a normal country right there's nothing exactly special about it that makes it be the absolute must-go location from its physicality places like italy have it a bit different they have just that perfect climate they have a long history that you cannot replicate anywhere it's a uh, central location in the mediterranean which is one of the most desirable places in the world its ability to within minutes travel to many really high uh important countries for travel for if you're going to live as an expat living in italy means you can be in spain in france in germany in switzerland in austria in in croatia in albania in greece Greece in, in an hour, right? A quick flight to all those places. Nicaragua has nothing like that, right? Um, so Nicaragua is much more like many countries around the world uh, where there is a desirable tourism market. There is a great set of pricing. There's really good reasons for wanting to live there, but they have to fit your needs, right? If you don't like the weather in Nicaragua, we don't have that much variety. So if this isn't the right weather for you, you're going to need to go somewhere else or put up with it, of course. If this is not the right time zone for you, sorry, we only have one time zone here. If this isn't the right latitude for you, which is 
a little bit more fuzzy, but we only have a very tight latitude area. If we don't have the flights that you need, or you're unable to get the visa that you need here, or it just isn't uh, a language that you can handle learning, there's so many factors. If Nicaragua doesn't check those boxes for you, it's not going to check those boxes. We don't have a lot of variety to work with. It's a great option for so many people, but for so many others, it's not. Um, it, it, it is how it is. You're going to find the same thing in Africa, for example. Morocco is in a similar position. It's very affordable. It's very close to a different very useful time zone. It is very close by ferry and soon by train from Europe and able to access things even better than Nicaragua can. It has better flight options than Nicaragua. It has uh, Atlantic coast instead of Pacific coast. Uh, lots of very big kind of general sweeping commonalities that make it a really great location for a lot of people, a harder language to learn for most of the people who watch my show. But there's a reason why people aren't just flooding into Morocco either. Many do, and as people discover how safe it is, how cost-effective it is, how great its combination of things, yes, it is a popular place for retirees. Yes, it is a popular place for digital nomads. All that is true, and that little tiny bit of people discovering it, partially through social media, does help Morocco have a little bit stronger of a tourism economy because they're bringing in a few digital nomads to work there. Those things make a difference they're not completely changing the face of the country. It remains cost effective. It remains culturally uh, basically as it is. Uh, and so when you have countries like this and they're spread all over the world, you're not going to see those big changes. It just doesn't happen that way. There's, there's a lot more fear of it happening than there is reality of it happening. When it does happen, and it does happen, uh, it's almost always isolated to either very small countries, uh, such as Panama. They have a lot more risk of it because they are um, less than half the size of Nicaragua from a uh, population standpoint. And the number of both tourists and expats that they have is much, much higher. So that combination has made it a long-term thing where it's just part of their culture. But it's kind of part of their culture from the beginning. So they're kind of a unique uh, country from that perspective within uh, the Western Hemisphere. And Costa Rica has focused on tourism as its major economy for a very long time. Um, and functions, and I've said this and people argue with me, uh, that it is essentially a colony of the United States. And people say that's not really fair. It doesn't operate like a colony. And it doesn't operate as much as like Guyana is a colony of the UK, but Costa Rica does have a lot of aspects like a colony such as relying on the US for its defense. It does not rely on the US for its foreign affairs, but because it does not have its own offense and technically does not exactly partner with the United States, but does in effective uh, behavior use the United States as its military to keep it safe, that means that its foreign policy is by and large at the whim of the United States. They could withdraw uh, military protection. They don't need to do anything hostile. Just simply say, oh, you're not going to do what we want. You're on your own. That makes them, for all intents and purposes, a colony. They can do a lot of things through their sovereignness internally. They could, if they wanted to, create their own military and break themselves of their status with the United States. Uh, but the reality is, is at least in their current state, they operate as if they were a colony in most ways. Um, and that's fine. That is done well for them in many ways. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with those choices. It is a very different tact than Nicaragua has taken, for example, and Costa Rica benefits in, in many ways from that. They get a ton of benefits from that. Uh, and Nicaragua suffers many ways uh, from that. But in reverse, there are a lot of problems that Costa Rica has because of that and many problems that Nicaragua has solved uh, in that way as well. So it, it, it's a different balance. Um, but they're those really isolated smaller countries with really high pushes towards expats and tourism and connections uh, to those markets are the ones that are most affected by it. And in reality, you can go to Costa Rica and even there, even in San Jose, you can go around much of the city and be shocked by how little influence there actually is from the United States. And I know that's the opposite of what we normally say because everywhere you go, you're like, wow, the influence is just so strong. And it is. But Costa Rica manages to maintain its own culture for the most part in most of the areas. There are definitely areas where it does not, but there are very large portions of the country, including the capital where they mostly do. Uh, and that's a lot to their credit that they're able to do that in the face of so many outside tourists. But luckily, they do get tourists from all over the world, not only the United States, and that helps water that down a little bit. If all of your tourists are from one place, that tends to skew you a lot more. If they're from all over, you tend to be able to have a little bit more strength in maintaining uh, your cultural identities in the face of all that. So I think that the, I think that the worry is overblown. Um, I think that... Uh, there's no 
realistic. Um, I know that when you're watching social media, when you're watching a YouTube channel and saying, okay, so we've had over a million views this year, fantastic. We've over, had over 175,000 unique people watching this show just over the last 90 days. Um, when you think about those kinds of numbers, you think that is going to absolutely overrun Nicaragua. There's gonna be just this massive army of people coming in. They're gonna move in so fast. They're gonna buy every house. They're gonna take up every spot on the beach. Everything's going to go and the prices are gonna go through the roof. It's gonna be another Costa Rica and it's gonna be all gone in six months. And I understand why it feels that way. And really roughly kind of just eyeballing it, I would say as many as a thousand families have moved into Nicaragua because of, or partially because of this show and ones that I know like it. But a few things you need to, to keep in mind. One, there are only four or five shows like this coming out of the country. Four or five, very, very few, and we're all very different. So those people who uh, like the material here, you may enjoy watching one of the other shows, but they're not likely to be the ones that draw you in and vice versa. If you really like one of those shows and then watch mine sometimes, theirs may be drawing you in and mine's like, well, that's some additional information. It's not gonna make me move, but I, I like the additional information, right? That, that tends to be how it is because we're very different from each other. So there's only a couple and our reach is only so big and we're all very small shows in a very small country. What we see everywhere in the country, including San Juan del Sur for the most part, is that houses that have been for sale remain for sale. Empty beachfronts remain empty beachfronts. Even in the cities, things are not turning over that fast. A little bit, but it's people moving around mostly, not new people coming in. Like I said, we've seen maybe a thousand people, a thousand families moving in from the US and Canada, maybe Western Europe. There's been a little bit of a mix, mostly North America, into the country. Uh, and we do notice that that has upticked from before, but the numbers are still very small. And keep in mind that the number of Nicaraguans leaving the country remains relatively high, not I think as high as it was. We've definitely seen that slow down as news from how bad conditions are and how many of the people that people know that have moved to North America desperately want to come back and are looking for ways to become financially solvent and be able to escape the US where they have now become indebted in many cases, uh, is, is, is trickling down. People are like, whoa, maybe I don't wanna go, um, but we're still seeing huge numbers go north. I'm not saying it's not happening, it's just not as much as it was, as far as I can tell. And on the ground, we're definitely, we had a time period where it was every time you had skilled labor, off they would go, they would save up and head to the United States. Those people have reported back that they wish they could come back. Can we give them jobs? Can we help them get back? Uh, and so, and many of them are jobless in the United States. They were, they were promised jobs. They thought everything was lined up and they got there and the housing that they had wasn't real. The job that they had didn't really come through. What they thought was a certain new life in the North turned into nothing but debt and panic and fear and, and they become trapped because it costs so much to return. Uh, they're often, they, they spent all their resources going one direction and didn't have a return plan because you really can't. Uh, and so as that's happened, things have changed a lot and we just aren't seeing the massive swarm going uh, like we used to. And other places have, have increased, right? Uh, we are hearing a lot more of like Haitians heading north. So there's still a large north flowing uh, trend, but it's much less coming from Nicaragua. Of course, Nicaragua was also sent. The people who wanted to go have mostly gone, right? So many people went that, that they've simply depleted that market. But what's important to note here is that the number of people in the country is decreasing from that not increasing. There's still a lot of births, so the population is still growing just slightly um, from what we've seen, but uh, the number of tourists moving in is much smaller than the number of Nicaraguans that have been moving out. So there's still a deficit from that. So keep that in mind in the, in the big picture that this is still a shrinking uh, adult system. Uh, from that though, we are not seeing houses be purchased, like all these things that we would see if there was actually a noticeable increase. Not just that I know someone who came, they said it was because of the channel. That's interesting, that's cool, but that doesn't show how the economy is changing. It doesn't show how the, the demographics are changing. What we would expect to see is things like uh, the airlines coming in from the US would, or, or other places, would add more routes and more airlines would come. We are still at a fraction of the routes operating as we had pre-COVID, and we don't have as many airlines operating as pre-COVID. Uh, notably, Delta, which operated up until uh, 2020, left the country and has not returned, and has not stated any plans to return. They've implied they're not going to return. 
right? Spirit had multiple flights before. They have said that they're probably going back to those multiple flights very soon, but at the moment they have not. They're still on a single flight per day, which is fine, but it is not a full flight and they don't have to have a second flight. That means we are not at traditional numbers of just people coming and going from the country in general. Houses are still empty compared to where they were seven years ago. Um, all those things indicate that we're not back to normal, even with the social media that you're seeing, let alone at a point where we're so far beyond normal that it is going to start affecting prices. Now keep in mind, right now prices are super deflated due to economic conditions, not because of a lack of expats. That's really key to some of this is that there are, just like in the United States, there are times where real estate becomes very expensive and there's times when it becomes very cheap and it is never because of tourists. It could be, but it never has been and it's not likely to be anytime in the next several millennium, but in theory it could be. Here in Nicaragua, the number of tourists have really no impact on the housing market. Uh, in theory they could, but it would take so many tourists coming here to make it higher and really no amount of tourists not coming here could make it lower. We're basically at the trough. So uh, we do expect that the housing prices are going to go up, but it's not going to be connected to tourists. It's going to be connected to economic recovery, mostly around an increase in the total number of jobs long before we see an increase in things like minimum wage or average salary. That's the biggest thing is the high unemployment rates. Those keep the housing markets depressed. There's no pressure for houses. So when people are buying houses, they're often second houses and you can wait an awfully long time to get a good deal on a second house. And so the market makes it a little bit more depressed. So key takeaways here. Social media does not influence the housing market and, and the cost of living in a country in the way that you imagine. That's in theory, plausible, but it borders on the theoretical. It is not realistically something you're going to see. More importantly, Nicaragua still has an incredibly tiny amount of social media, and so we're not up to a social media baseline yet, and I am doing what I can to lead that charge. Elton is uh, working really hard to kind of uh, do that as well, but we're kind of the only ones working in really that way. Jack Pittman does a bit, but he's been silent for months. I haven't even heard from him. I've been trying to reach him actually to check in uh, for quite some time. He hasn't posted since we did, well, one episode after we did an interview together. So, you know, even though he's trying to get the word out there, it's very sporadic. Uh, it's a very small audience um, and very little growth. There are, there's a couple new shows popping up here and there, but there's always a few popping up and a few going away. Uh, and and our, our biggest channels in the country that we've seen uh, traditionally over the last few years, we see with massive shrinkage. Uh, and so they're just, if anything, there's actually less social media today than there was three years ago. Uh, arguably, and if there's not, it's about status quo. So we're at a very low, I mean, absolutely crazy low amount, at least of English language tourism. If you want to talk about Spanish language tourism uh, vlogging, there is a fair amount with way more traffic, but that doesn't tend to lead to expats. The number of expats moving in from other Spanish speaking countries is essentially zero. You never see someone from Spain, Mexico, Argentina. Well, Argentina you do, just a few. Um, but Chile, uh, Bolivia, Colombia, you're not seeing those populations here. Venezuela, yes. Cuba, yes. US, yes. Canada, a ton. Um, Brazil, a tiny amount. Argentina, a tiny amount. Those are big countries though, with huge populations, so you're expecting to see them. Um, so, so while there's a lot of vlogging, a lot of people take an interest and maybe you get a lot of tourists from there, you're not getting expats from those countries. Uh, the expats really are coming from English speaking countries almost entirely. It's a few European non-English, uh, French and, and Polish and Czech and those kinds of places. Um, but uh, there is so little social media today that no, I, we can safely say that the existing social media is attempting to stem a negative flow of social media influence. We're actually far below a necessary baseline. There isn't enough to sustain what needs to be here. Um, even with a good healthy amount of social media, we are not getting the tourism that we would hope to get for a baseline. So we're still at a, it's causing depression, uh, economic depression um, because of the lack of tourism. Uh, and we have no indicators that any amount of push, even if hundreds of amazing, way better than me, influencers move into the country and really get the word out there and, and bring up the new people interested in the country by 10 times. 
We don't expect that that would have a noticeable impact on anything. If you sold 100 times the number of houses that are selling right now, you would notice, but you would still have empty houses all over the place. Not nearly as many, the prices would start to come up, people would be a little bit more aggressive in arguing with you about the prices, but you would not be at a point where you'd use up the available ones and want to start building because you didn't have enough, right? We're so far from those things that there's, I think there's just so many steps here that protect it from social media and getting the word out, um, creating too many tourists or creating a, an increase in the cost and, and throwing off the cost of living and factors uh, that people enjoy here. Uh, and very importantly, if that started to happen, there are natural breaks that happen economically. It, it, this is global capitalism at play at a tourism level. As the cost of flights, as the cost of food, as the cost of housing increases by 1%, then 2%, then 3%, the number of people who are interested because it was low cost start to dwindle. And unless you somehow attract people who are attracted to Nicaragua for other reasons, and there are many other reasons to be here, we are not here because it's low cost. It's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about it. But the biggest factor for the largest number of people looking at Nicaragua specifically today is its low cost. So if that was to change by a significant factor, that would automatically take some of the people who live here and cause them to go look afield. And it would cause a huge percentage of the people who are looking at Nicaragua for the future to say, oh, it doesn't meet our needs and look elsewhere. And those things will naturally counteract uh, the addition of social media uh, quite strongly. So I'd love some discussion on this. Everyone get down below and talk about which places uh, you have seen that have been influenced by social media in this way, where these things have happened. Happened. Clearly, some countries are very, very impacted by all of their tourism, Costa Rica being the absolute prime example. We can go there quickly. You, you go between Nicaragua and Costa Rica and you will just be hit in the face with the incredible difference. And it's obvious that tourism is a massive contributing factor to the differences. Not to say one is better or worse, but they are different in ways that tourism uh, creates very specifically. You can feel when you're in Costa Rica, it immediately feels like you're in a uh, central Florida with the uh, Orlando Disney Universal kind of vibe where there's big attractions, everything's focused on attractions, everything is uh, logistics to handle all the tourists and expats coming through. And when you're in Nicaragua, instantly it's the opposite. There's nothing for those things. There's no mechanisms, no logistics, no signs, no advertising, nothing. You're on your own. It's just a, a bedroom community for Managua and and, and Costa Rica is a, a tourism center coast to coast. Both are wonderful in different ways. It's great that we're right next to each other. We can go back and forth and get the best of both worlds very easily. So we know that this kind of disparity can happen and it can happen in this region. And if it can happen in Costa Rica, in theory, it can happen to Nicaragua. But there are so many factors different between them. And one of those biggest factors is that there already is a Costa Rica. If what you want is that really polished tourism experience. You want that bigger variety of food and you want that you're willing to pay more and you want it more Americanized and you want the American selection and you want everything in English if possible. And you're, you're just, then you're going to select Costa Rica because it's the amazing choice for those people. If that's what you want, it's hard to beat. It's fantastic. Right, so Nicaragua's never going to be Costa Rica. Even if they tried, even if every social media wanted it to happen, if the government wanted it to happen, if the people wanted it to happen, it isn't going to happen, right? That's not going to happen. They, they don't have the power to do it because Costa Rica was first. And so Costa Rica will always be Costa Rica. Georgia can't be another Florida. They could try, they could get partway there, they could never pull it off. Florida has something unique because they were first in the market and because of their position ge geologically. Uh, no, geographically. But uh, the the disparity here is the draw. It's not just a draw for Nicaragua. It's also the draw for Costa Rica. That Costa Rica is so dramatically one direction and Nicaragua is so dramatically the other right next to each other. And both present amazing opportunities for people who want to explore the region. Being different from each other so much is to both of their benefits. They both want to stay that way for, for their own cultural reasons and for economic reasons. So uh, I, I, you're really going to find that uh, the, the concern, I think, should be minimized. This is not something to realistically be worried about. This is not how things are going to play out. These are not things you have to worry about. And if they were going to happen, they're going to happen regardless of social media. Social media is not the factor that's going to swing these things. Uh, it, it just it, it doesn't move the bar that much. 
and social media as it happens. It's the social media of Costa Rica, the social media of Mexico, the social media of the United States. Those things are much bigger factors for Nicaragua than the social media of Nicaragua is. And that's confusing, but everything that happens in Nicaragua itself is so small on such a small scale, including our social media, that we're not the ones moving the bar significantly. We're trying and we're trying to stem the tide of, of lack of social media and all the things that that entails. But at best, we can try to bring it up closer to that baseline. And maybe someday we'll hit that baseline. We're very far from that now. So I think great questions. I want to know more from you guys on your thoughts on this, other places, ask your questions and ask questions for other episodes. I'd love all the conversation we have below. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, which means so much to me, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That pays for the cameras and computers and helps cover some of the time we put into all this. It doesn't really, it just barely starts to cover some of the cameras. Um, it doesn't come close to even paying for the cameras, but it does help a lot. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. And as always, uh, tell your friends and family about the show, share anywhere you can on social media shows like this episodes like this one that are broad, broadly applicable, getting them out there on Reddit or, or Facebook really does help, uh, get the word out there about the show. We've had such amazing growth this year. Thanks to you guys and, uh, to everyone who lives in my little GoPro box. I will see all of you tomorrow. There's a certain percentage of the human population. Ooh, we got wind all of a sudden.